Hi, everyone, and welcome to How the Wise One Grows. Before we get started, let's just take a moment to settle in and land here together with three deep breaths. So wherever you are, just take a moment to notice where your body connects to the earth. Notice where in the body you feel the breath. And take a big breath in. Fill your chest. Fill your belly with air. Exhale. Open your mouth. Let it all out. Again, inhale. Fill your chest. Fill your belly with air. Exhale. Open your mouth. Let it go. One more inhale and exhale and return to where your body touches the earth and you can slowly open your eyes as you return to this space. Thank you all so much for joining today. I'm really excited for today's conversation. We have Chelsea Ingle here to talk all about the Enneagram and I first encountered the Enneagram when I was living in Nashville. I was working at a coffee shop. Shout out to Ugly Mugs, best place in the world. (laughs) Um, And the people who worked there were really into the Enneagram. And we got really into it as a staff and kind of all knew each other's types. And it really helped the way we worked together. And one of my coworkers who was really into it gave me a book about the Enneagram And as I was reading the chapter about my type, which is a two wing three, I was like, oh my gosh, (laughs) I felt like I was reading a diary of my deepest, darkest secrets that I had never told anyone before. And it really blew my mind. It really just spoke to all the ways I was feeling inside. And it was a big comfort knowing like, oh, I'm not alone in this. So I'm really excited that we have Chelsea here today to talk all about the Enneagram. Chelsea, do you mind sharing for those who aren't familiar with it, what the Enneagram is? Absolutely. Yes. What a beautiful introduction there. And um, for anyone else who is a type two, you're going to have two (laughs) type twos talking today. So a lot of empathy and heart and and love and caring going into this beautiful podcast. And are you a wing one or a wing that. three? I'm balanced wings. So oh, I, you have access, to tell us. <laughs> it's okay. I accessed both of them prior to doing the work. I was a two wing three, but now mm-hmm. I am aware of when I'm accessing my wings and mostly are mostly within my own type, but just turn on my wings when I need them. Right. Love okay. it. Yeah. So for those of you who are new to the Enneagram or have a definition of the Enneagram that's different than mine. This is how I define it. Um, It is a self-discovery tool. So it is a way for us to go within ourselves and understand the core motivations, core fears, and core desires that are driving our attitudes and behaviors. So many of us are living automatically just within our personality structures, going about our, our days, trying to get our needs met, in the best way we know how. And the Enneagram allows us to wake up to those things, wake up to ourselves and make conscious choices so that we can live more present and connected and um, be uh, choosing when we want those drivers to, to be there for us. But instead of living more driven, we live more drawn. So we're more able to say yes to those things that are, um, that are aligned with our true essence rather than just saying yes to things without knowing why. Um, And that's especially for us twos, we're kind of those people pleaser type Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Ss. And so a lot of people, I will hear them say like, oh yeah, I did the Enneagram, you know, at work or I did the Enneagram Mm -hmm. with friends. And I'm like, what do you mean you did the Enneagram? Because we think of it as a test, a personality test, but that test is just one kind of not great way (laughs) to figure out what your type might be. Um, And so uh, I just, I I will say the Enneagram is an entire system that helps you to deeply dive into, feel seen, understood, heard, and um, be curious about yourself and and the lenses that others wear in the world as well. Mm. So how is the Enneagram different than other personality types? And then you said like, you know, it's not just a personality test you take. Do you mind explaining 
better ways to learn our type so that we can understand ourselves better and become more seen and understood as yeah absolutely yeah for sure um you know there's a lot of beautiful tests out there a lot of beautiful structures out there you know you got the strengths finders you got the discs you've got the mbti you got you know there's there's many you different just named so many there. i don't know <laughs> that's okay i mean it's, it's my job i hope i would know a few things like i don't know those very well but what i do yeah. know is i interacted with a few of those throughout my career and my time and all of those were definitely eye-opening um but the difference between those and the enneagram is again the enneagram is based off of the why so it mm. doesn't put you into a box and say like this is how you behave it's it tells you why you do that and so um there's not really a good test out there who that can that can get to that because they mostly focus on behaviors mm -hmm. and each of the types, there are nine types. That's it's called the Enneagram. Ennea meaning nine, and gram is the diagram, which is a circle that has interconnected arrow lines um, between mm -hmm. because the types are interconnected. And um and, and basically, you know, it focuses a lot of the tests will focus on behaviors, like have you choose between you know, this behavior and this behavior, well, maybe both are true, you know, or maybe neither are true, um, mm -hmm. but you're kind of forced into picking one. And then that's getting, you know, defined as you, even if it's not. And also for me as a type two, I don't love conflict. I will get into it if, with people if I need to. Um, type nines don't love conflict. Type sixes don't love conflict. Type ones don't like conflict. And so, but why? So why I don't like conflict is different than why a type nine doesn't like conflict. And so getting a little bit further under the surface of why you're choosing those behaviors. Um, I also feel like, okay, so you take the test and then it tells you your type, but what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. And you didn't, you don't know which things you answer that are about that type. And so, um, the, the way many of us certified coaches really say is self discovery. So you can take a test, but that's, Step one. Step two is to go deeper, do the reading like you got a book, listen to podcasts. Um, there's lots of panel podcasts out there of other people who are the same type and you can listen to their thinking and, and hear just like you said, it's like a diary, but it's them like talking like you would if you were on there answering those questions. It's beautiful to be in community with. It's it's called the, the like the narrative Enneagram tradition. Um, but what I offer as a coach is it's called a typing session and I sit with you. You are the expert of yourself and I know the Enneagram. So I listen to you, your patterns of speech, um, the things that you desire. I ask you a lot of why questions and I connect you with your type and then teach you about it so that it's not just a, that was cool, but like you feel mm -hmm. known, understood, and you understand your type and why you are that type. Mm, I love that. So two threads I really want to pull from that mm -hmm. is one I love that you are really keen into wanting to understand the why I think mm -hmm. that is like you said why I felt like I was reading like my diary because mm -hmm. it was like these are all the things I'm thinking in my head and feeling so deeply like these deep core beliefs and wants mm -hmm. um, and how I'm engaging with them but for me I have noticed um through taking tests again, like years later, kind of being like, oh, I don't, I'm not answering as much as I would this way before. And my mm -hmm. type comes out differently. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious is to, are we like locked into a certain type over time? And I think the really beautiful thing that I loved about the Enneagram, at least the book I read was there's like uh, aspects when you're healthy and aspects when you're unhealthy. And I can see the progression of like maybe taking that when I was more unhealthy to leaning into a time where I am more healthy, um, that difference. But also aside from leaning to healthy and unhealthy, can your type change over time? Yeah, that's one of the most um, common questions that I get, right? Because like, well, I'm changing and shifting. So is my type changing and shifting? Mm -hmm. And the short answer is no, because your mm -hmm. motivators are not changing. Your why is not changing. You still as a type two want to be loved, wanted, sometimes needed to be appreciated and to be seen as loving, kind, generous, and selfless. That will yes. never change. <laughs> that's not going to change, right? The idea of the Enneagram is to bring awareness to those desires and fears and to, again, instead of that being what's in 
the driver's seat, you're mm-hmm. in the driver's seat. So you were unconscious to those before and they were driving you. Now that you're more aware of them, you're able to say, oh, I was doing that because I want them to like me, not mm-hmm. because it's what is most um, authentic to my self. And, and so, yeah, when I take a test now, most of those average level behaviors, because people who create tests put the average level behaviors on the test, because most people who come into the Enneagram system have not done the work to become awake to themselves. And so those average level behaviors is what they're going to see. Um, you referenced the healthy, unhealthy. There's, there's actually nine levels of development. They're called the levels of psychological development that were developed by Riso and Hudson from the Enneagram Institute ranging all the way from unhealthy pathological destructiveness all the way up to the level of liberation Um, at each of these levels of development another fear arises when you're at the top you're at your true essence you've let go and and your level of liberation you're free from all your fears and desires sounds great right yeah does that one happen (laughs) as, as human beings you know we are trying to get our needs met. And that's where our ego Mm -hmm. structure comes in at at the um, second level of development, still healthy, still balanced, but that's where our self image comes in. And then Mm -hmm. another level down, still healthy, still balanced, but a little more identified with that ego. And then we go down into the average levels. And that's where we become, now there's fears and desires compounded on each other from each of those levels. And we're more identified with them. And our stress arrow comes in and our, um, our defense mechanisms come in at this level. And this is when we start getting into the levels of interpersonal control where we're starting to, how come you're doing that that way? How come they're not doing that that way? And we're identified with our personalities instead of being free from them. And so again, Mm -hmm. the Enneagram doesn't put you into a box and tell you how to behave or how you behave. It like opens the box and lets you see that you can have freedom from these behaviors and attitudes that are no longer serving you that are unproductive for you. And with clarity, because I can mm-hmm. put the core dynamics of what I just described to you in front of someone and help them to like dive into that and go like for us as twos at the, at the level of interpersonal control, which is level five gossiping. Tell me about your background with gossiping and, and why you may have done it in the past or have you done it in the past as a mm-hmm. type two? You know, I will honestly say, like, I don't feel like I, in my more adult life, has have been huge on gossip. I remember one moment vividly mm-hmm. um, with my best friend, Emma, when I was in middle school and we were, like, talking on the phone all the time, as mm-hmm. you do. And I think I was, like, gossiping about something. And mm-hmm. Emma was kind of like, you know, like, I don't really think that's a cool thing to do. And wow. I was like, oh. And then I kind of was like, yeah, I think you're right. I don't really think that is either. And I notice now when I have these moments of like if I share something that I'm like, oh, maybe that wasn't okay to share. Like Mm -hmm. someone shared something to me in confidence, but it wasn't clear. Don't say this. But then I shared it and was like, oh, I wish that didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. There's something inside of me that's like, okay, that didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay what happened in that moment, but I'm going to be more intentional about that moving forward. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like you're really awake to yourself around these things. Most people who are in the average levels Um, as a type two, again, this is just very specific Mm -hmm. to our type structure. Um, we want to connect with people again, we want to be loved, wanted and needed. And so when we're central in people's lives, when people come to us and tell us things that feels really good. So we like Mm -hmm. to be the knower of all things and like for people to share all of their things with us. Mm -hmm. And then what ends up happening is, is we get swept up in conversations about others when we're just trying to connect in our minds, we have the best of intentions of just connecting with others, but really what we're doing is gossiping or complaining. Mm -hmm. And so, um, for people who aren't awake to that practice, they'll say, and for me personally, when I started using the Enneagram, um, for personal growth, I was like, Oh no, like everyone's just kind of chitty chatting and talking and whatever. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't realize how central I was to like maintaining that gossiping. So when I put that personal boundary in, I will no longer gossip the amount of, of mental, physical, and emotional energy that I had back because I was putting so much of it into, oh, I hope they don't tell someone what I just did. Oh, I hope I don't get thrown under the bus later. My shame was just like, 
going mm-hmm. crazy. And when I put the personal boundary up is like, I'm not going to do that anymore. I wasn't, I didn't have a great friend like you that said, that's not very cool to do that. So mm-hmm. I feel like if I would have gotten called out, um, maybe, but like, again, I thought I had the best of intentions, which is what us twos do. Mm-hmm. And we convince ourselves with our pride that we do have the best of intentions and we're not doing anything to hurt anyone. Um, because we wouldn't want to see ourselves in that light. So it's, yeah. it's one of those, like, it's just one behavior on the list of many behaviors that if you can work around and see how you get so much energy back from that and replace it with a healthy behavior of direct communication or just choosing not to, that's like one strategy for twos to just like make a big difference in that if they're a gossiper. <laughs> mm-hmm. See, I feel like for me, it comes out more in that people pleasing realm. Okay. Like really people pleasing and maybe saying or doing things that I think other people want me to do, but I don't necessarily want to or agreeing with things that I don't necessarily agree with. Mm-hmm. And that's something I'm really trying to hone in on is like, it takes me a little bit to process information too. So like a lot of times, especially on the podcast, it's like I'm listening to people and I'm mm-hmm. soaking in what you're saying, but I'm not necessarily in agreement with everything mm-hmm. that someone is saying, but I don't quite have the vocabulary to express that yet. Like I need some time to sit with. And in, you know, in other life situations, there's truly just like the discomfort of confrontation and disagreement and this fear of like, oh, I'm not going to be loved if I don't Mm -hmm. agree with you or seem perfect to you in these ways. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think a lot of what you said that uh, type two would align with and a type nine, and those are Mm. both twos and nines mistype as each other quite a bit because nines fear conflict, but they really fear being overlooked, dismissed, loveless, and separated. And Mm -hmm. so to them, conflict will equal in their souls, conflict will equal them being separated from someone. Mm -hmm. And so they just, just kind of dismiss conflict and, or try to people please and keep everybody like, if you're good and okay, I'm good and okay. Mm -hmm. And so that all of us can kind of be in this calm inner peace space. And that's mm-hmm. why they're called the peaceful mediator because they will ensure and they can see all sides where it's like, I see where you're coming from. I see where you're coming from. Let me process this. Right. Um, and, and they do want everyone to be seen, heard and understood, but in the meantime, they lose their own opinions, their own thoughts and their own needs, mm-hmm. um, and fall asleep to themselves because like fall asleep to themselves in their inner knowing because they're so busy making sure everyone else feels happy and good that they lose who they are. So a lot of times Mm -hmm. nines and twos will mistype because of that. But twos, we are much more like the gossipers, the talkers, the in your face people who are going to try to do things for you, um, give you advice that you didn't ask for. And this is all the negative traits. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of Mm -hmm. positive traits in us too. Um, But we, we show up even when we're not asked and um, kind of get in people's business, even when, and we don't really realize we're doing it. We have no boundaries in that way. Nines are much more in the more like laid back era of life Mm -hmm. and they'll help you if you ask, but they're not going to come get in your business or, and they probably won't gossip about people and things like that because that's not nice. Like my husband's Mm -hmm. a nine. And when I was gossiping about people, he'd be like, why are you talking badly about people? And I'm like, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I was like, I was. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I the nine element kind of reminded me a lot of like tendencies with codependence as well. I, I guess I'm curious of, well, first of all, like why is it important to understand the intentions and motivations behind our behaviors and how can we use that to grow? Mm-hmm. And then also how and does the Enneagram relate to – other patterns of behavior like codependence, like people pleasing. Do you notice like certain types are more inclined to certain areas? Can you be inclined to like as a two, would it be a thing to be a uh, codependent or is that more indicative of a nine? Would that I'm curious about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're picking up on patterns already for sure. So the the why is it important to know your Enneagram type and what can you do with it once you know it? Um, it, it's kind of like the, it's like an existential question, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. like the big, it's the big work, right? Um, for me, the reason I think it's most important for my clients to understand 
it's that what you were talking about where you felt like you were reading your diary where they feel yeah. seen understood they don't feel alone anymore like there's not like oh there's not this isn't something wrong with me so it's that self acceptance it's that being in community with others who can deeply know and understand you it's the idea that you knew people had different points of view but now knowing like just as true and real as your lens is to you that you view the world so is theirs so i don't need to take it so personally when your lens is speaking differently and i don't need to worry about really where you're going with your thoughts and behaviors because that's your journey and so for me as a type two we are the most codependent of all the nine types we really are especially mm -hmm. in our average and unhealthy levels um not that other types are not but that we really are like classic codependency and mm -hmm. so you know me owning my own crap really and understanding myself and turning my lens onto myself and taking care of myself that was the journey for me. And each of the nine types has their own journey that's so deeply important for them to recognize and realize. And the message of the core longing, which is that message your soul needs to hear for us too, is it is you are loved and wanted just for who you are. You don't have to do things for other people. You don't have to help other people to get love and want you are mm -hmm. worthy of love just for who you are. You are love at your essence. Mm -hmm. And we need to truly, deeply, madly believe that. And when I have that connection moment with a um, any of the nine types and I say that core longing to them and I give them that message of, of that, it's like this moment where their soul recognizes, I don't believe that about myself and why not? And so that's the work because that one thing that you truly want to believe that's going to set you free from these fears and desires is your work to do. And everyone can keep giving, like everyone can keep saying, Holly, you're amazing. Holly, I love you. Holly, everything you do for people is amazing. But it, it just goes right through you until you can fully believe that about yourself. Mm -hmm. And so if we each took the time to turn the mirror on ourselves, deeply understand where we're coming from, and then learn all of the other lenses what a beautiful world this would be because we'd have a deeper understanding and empathy for people around us. So mm -hmm. that's why I love the Enneagram. <laughs> um, and I'll let you, if, if you want to add anything there, and then I can go on to the next question about the codependency and the proclivities to that if you'd like. But Yeah. Well, I really love that because so my uh, life's work is rooted in mindfulness and yoga. And what you were just saying reminds me a bit about what you were saying before about like the ego. I think a lot of this work can come into play with, you know, be, having that awareness of like our thought patterns, our longings, mm -hmm. our ego, and being able to witness it instead of over identifying with mm -hmm. it. Um, so I think that's a really cool parallel where mindfulness can help us work with this really powerful tool. And just kind of check in of like, oh, this is my ego here. This is a thought pattern that's not necessarily true. And as you were speaking, I was also wondering, like, does – are we just like born this way? Is it rearing? I kind of notice – my two like need to be loved, never feeling loved enough, I almost think is like a generational trauma or pattern mm -hmm. that I took on from my grandmother. Mm -hmm. I, is that a thing or where yeah, do I the mean, types come from? I'll tell you my own personal beliefs on it. I've done reading on it. And obviously over the past few years of being a certified coach, I've been a witness to other people's journeys, supporting them through that. And so just, just my own take on it. I don't think that there's going to be any scientific proof that mm -hmm. we can't go to an infant and say, what are your core motivators? What is your lens through which you're viewing the world? Um, they wouldn't be able to tell us that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, um, where I come from is kind of like this idea that we are born with our lens. Um, for me, my children in the womb were two different unique individuals they have maintained that same energy since they came out of me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I don't know yet what their type is. I'm very, you know, and I don't want them to be a type because that means you're over identified. Right. But I'm curious about who they're going to become and what patterns and what things they are going to have. But I truly believe they come out and, and there's three stances. There's a sort of aggressive, there's dependent and there's withdrawn. And people have this energy of against energy towards energy or away. Um, and 
I feel from my daughter, this towards energy, this very dependent stance energy, those are types one, two, and six. For my, my son, I feel is very against energy. He's, and he's either probably going to be a three, seven, or eight. I don't know yet. Mm-hmm. But what the, what the research says or what all of the Enneagram stuff is, is your type is actually based off of all of it starts with your orientation to your parental figure. So we have a nurturing figure and we have a protective figure. Now, generally speaking, you think nurturing is going to be your mother and protective is going to be your father. This is a whole long talk, but basically, even if they didn't protect or nurture you, they're probably the person you view as those things. Not for sure, but that's, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of the way it is. And you either have a connection to, which means you identify with them, a disconnection, which means you do not identify with them, or an ambivalence to, which was you wanted to connect, but you didn't quite know how. And so you tried Mm -hmm. to find your place in the family. Each of the nine types has one of those different for each. And that's how they come at the world. So for us as type twos, we have an ambivalence towards our protective figure. And that means that we didn't know how to fully connect. We didn't know how, but we didn't want to disconnect. We didn't want to be rejected. So we have this in-between space and that's how we kind of come at the world where it's like, I really want to connect with you, but I'm afraid you're going to reject me. And it's like one foot in the door, one foot out. We're just trying to connect and trying to find a place to belong and be loved. Um, And so for us to do that, instead of uh, we, we need to find a place in our family that we felt that we, we could be um, kind of complementary to that protective figure so that we could connect with them. So we become the nurturer. We sit next to them and nurture. And that's how we do. That's how we come at the world. We nurture the world. We nurture people we meet in hopes that we will have that connection that we're searching for. So mm-hmm. there's a common childhood experience that each of the nine types has due to that connection, disconnection or ambivalence. And there's nothing that I can like that I can point out to say for sure, for everyone that happens that creates that, I believe that you just come into the world with it. And then that's the lens that you're viewing the world and it gets reinforced through Mm. your nurturing or not. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's my belief. So take it with your brain. Yeah. Something that I've always found really helpful about the Enneagram too is this acknowledgement and correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I was presented with it was that like you are all of the types, like you have all of these types in you, you have all these different like healthy and unhealthy things about all of them at some degree. And it's just the one that you really gravitate towards, or as I guess, as you're saying, as like the lens you're seeing the world through, is that Mm -hmm. a correct interpretation? Yeah. I mean, because so when you're over identified with your ego and you're in the average levels, it's pretty obvious what your type is most of the time. Um, well, I should back up. It can be, <laughs> it can be mm-hmm. pretty obvious what your type is because you're over identified with your ego, right? In that average level. But the work is to actually get out of your type and prove to yourself this is just a story that you've been telling yourself, and it's just mm. a, a a bunch of basically behaviors and attitudes that come from fears and desires that are not real. And so the more you can misidentify, take away the, you know, structures of your type and become more free, the more you identify more with all of the types. And so there's this mm-hmm. thing called the rule of seven. It's it's intense. We won't get too far into it today because it'll kind of when we haven't talked about all the nine types, but look it up if you want to. But basically the idea is that we process through the lens of each of the nine types. Um, and you might get stuck in one kind of for a little bit, but like, yeah, you process through each of them and like getting to know their lens and understanding where they're coming from helps you to, again, realize it's not just about what I want in the world and helps you to see how much you do want Mm -hmm. the things the other people want and the desires that they have. So again, your type does not change. You don't become those types, but you just learn more and take on more of like, oh, that's how you're seeing the world. Um, the grace that I need to learn about from the type one is this and the, you know, being competent and capable from the five is what I need to learn from them and safety and security is what I need to learn from the six. And so just taking on these different lenses and understanding them can help us and you can, yeah, lean into them. Now we have direct lines that are resource points for us, um, that we access from our type structure, uh, that that helps support us and also can take on some of the not so great things. So you have the stress or arrow of disintegration that you naturally kind of take on some of those unhealthy attributes of another type. And then you have the arrow of growth or integration. And that's that that guidance that's basically the type that has oppositional behaviors of you. Like, man, I wish I could be more fill in the blank. 
That's mm-hmm. probably the type that you need to lean in more. Why? To prove to yourself the story you've been telling yourself is not true. You mm-hmm. can be more that way. It's there for you to take. And when you do that, you'll find there's so much more mental, emotional, and physical energy for you to like be in the world with and be present with, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's connections to the different types. But sometimes when people hear that, they're like, so it just doesn't matter. And it's like, no, the first step in all of this is knowing what your core type is and, and undoing <laughs> undoing all of the um, you know personality work that has been holding you in place. And then it's exploring and getting to know all the other lenses. Mm. Yeah. And just a side note for those who are listening right now in the show notes, Chelsea gave us this like really amazing, just brief overview of all the types. So if you know your type, you can kind of look at that as you're listening to this conversation, or if you end up working with Chelsea or taking a test or engaging with your type in another way, that's a resource um, to carry with you as well. But I really love what you were saying too about how it can be like stepping back from that lens you were used to seeing, remembering like that story and Mm -hmm. right, it's a story, it's not true. Mm -mm. And it reminds me a lot, I think of, I'm really into the work of Kristen Neff and the science of self-compassion. Okay. And a lot of, I think what you're saying can really help cultivate that deep self-compassion with like the why this is maybe why these patterns can come up, but also there's a key component in that healing process of common humanity, Mm -hmm. of knowing that like, I am not alone in this, that there are other people who feel this way too. There are other people who feel suffering in ways different than the suffering that I feel, but it's a root cause that's connecting all of us. So I really love the way that the Enneagram can be a tool to also highlight those elements that I have found really healing as well. Absolutely. I, I've, when, when my clients have that moment, they're like, so other people think like this too. I'm like, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Other people think like this too. And you're not alone. And I think the fact that there is this, I mean, it's a little bit cumbersome to see at first because you don't understand how you're going to get there, but to see the levels of development and to see these healthy attributes that are there for you to take, it's an invitation for you to start to think about. And I, I tell people, Let's not get overwhelmed here. You're not, again, you're not becoming that other type, right? Mm -hmm. You're looking at spaces and places where you have security in your life that you can maybe start edging in some of these more um, favorable and productive um, attitudes and behaviors in your life. So like, let's say if 90% of your day is taken up with your type structure, you just bring in 10% of your day with some of the other type structure to sort of like replace unwanted behaviors or unwanted attitudes that are not serving you any longer. So for us as type twos, we go to that type four and they are the romantic individualists. They're super in- introspective. They're very much so knowing who, like working on who they are authentically, um, self-reflecting and all of those things. And we, our brain space is literally 90% taken up with other people's needs and wants mm-hmm. without us even recognizing it. So just stopping for a minute of the day, doing the breathing exercises you did, and just looking at myself, what do I need today? What do I need today to fill my own cup? And, and regardless of what everyone else thinks of it. Right. And so I think that it's just like, well, I can't do that all the time. I'm not going to go from thinking about other people 90% of the time to thinking about other people 5% of the time, but can I inch in a little bit more time for introspection, a little bit more time for self growth and self love? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and the, to me, one of the best tools for that is the Enneagram because there's so much for you to learn about. And you're also learning about other people at the same time, which we love to do. So (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, for me, it really kind of is like, man, I feel like this is why I have delved so deep into yoga and mindfulness because it's been a really key way for me to get in my body, Mm -hmm. know what I need and hold my own gravity and carry that as I engage with other people instead of just getting so lost in those things and consumed by it. Yeah. We have to have time alone because we literally feel like that's our core differentiator. We feel other people's needs. Mm -hmm. And then if we're not aware of that, we just go into action without even recognizing it. And so uh, you keep talking about the body. So there's three centers of intelligence, the head, the heart, and the body center. And what happens is we are heart types. And so Mm -hmm. we lead with that and we feel things And then we get right into action on those things and we're repressed in our head center. We don't take the time to think through what does this mean for me? What does this mean for them? What is it's just we feel their need and we jump into action and we need to be curious about 
Did they ask for that? Is this what mm. we want to do? Is this, who am I doing this for? Really? Who am I doing this for? Who is this for? And did mm -hmm. they ask for it? <laughs> like, and, and like just those little small questions. So yes, taking the time to be contemplative in your own space. Like I have to get away from people sometimes. I'm a people person but I can feel the energy of the room when I'm in it and it's overwhelming. So I have to get into the quiet space and protect myself time and time again so that I can come back to myself. So all those practices that you're in, like that's why you're in the healthier space. That's why you have those and the introspection. So mm -hmm. it's nothing that you haven't known, but knowing that you're doing it now intentionally because you see it as a plan for yourself to be free from those fears and desires feels like a whole different level of doing life. And that's what I love about the Enneagram too, is the intentionality behind the actions we have. Mm, yeah. So much of what you said was just like, yep, <laughs> yep, feel all of those things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So as we've been talking more about um, how the Enneagram impacts our relationships, do you mind speaking to like how it impacts the way we engage with people and how it can be used to deepen intimate relationships? When Absolutely. you were saying my husband hasn't been like, he's done a test, but doesn't know as much about it, but I'm pretty sure he's a type nine as well. So I found that interesting. <laughs> Yeah, we complement each other really well. Um, there's so much to talk about here. We could have a whole nother podcast all about relationships and Enneagram. It's one of my favorites. Uh, it's how I was introduced to the Enneagram. I was in couples counseling with my husband after having a child and we just were missing each other, but we weren't in crisis. Um, and he, uh, the therapist basically brought up the Enneagram to us because the issues we were having were both personality issues. Mm -hmm. There's so much about our personality structures that were complementary but that we're also holding us back from having those deep, intimate conversations because we both mm -hmm. were trying to people please the other person and letting our own needs and desires go to the side and then feeling like the other person wasn't meeting our needs and desires, even though they were working so hard to do so. Um, and it, it's so clear to me now that I know our types. I'm like, oh, geez, that's what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually do couples typing sessions and I will mm -hmm. sit with a couple and, and, and talk to them, listen to them. Um, push back on them and let them hear each other. Um, I'm very careful to put boundaries in where it's like, when it's your turn, it's your turn. So there's a safe space for us to do this. But hearing the deep connection with some of the not so great behaviors, you know, your um, significant other might have and hearing them like come to terms with where that's coming from and you understanding where it's coming from just allows for this, this empathy and understanding and, oh, that's where mm -hmm. that's coming from. Oh, that's why you're doing that. Okay. So now I don't need to take it so personally when you need some time and space because you need autonomy, you are withdrawn type, type nines, mm -hmm. you, you know, all these things. Okay. So that, what does that mean about me and what I need? And so it gives us like this third person, in the conversation, and I'm very careful to never utilize it as like a pointing a finger situation, but it just kind of gives me kind of the insight into his thinking and his doing or not doing in his case sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it just gives us a beautiful way for us to talk. Now he hasn't engaged with it quite as much as I have, obviously it's my life, but, um, I do find that, you know, I work with a singles group and helping them get to know themselves first before they start dating people, having the, the kind of questions that you get asked in order to learn about yourself, utilizing those in like a dating field is just like, to me, an amazing way to have that more intimate connection with someone rather than just like, what do you like to do? You know? Mm -hmm. So it, it's just an awesome tool to have in your back pocket when you're, even if the other person doesn't know their type, you can kind of use the line of questioning to sort of like get under the surface, which of course for us too, is we love, but not everybody's like all about those deep, intimate conversations. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I totally relate with what you were saying there as well. Um, I definitely noticed that element of like that empathy and ability to have compassion being so key. Like I noticed that comes up for us, a, a tool that's been really helpful is astrology. Mm -hmm. And then like when, uh, will my husband will show different patterns, like before that I would take so personally, now I'm able to take a step back and be like, oh, I can have compassion for you here because I understand where that's coming from and it's not so much about me. And I think the Enneagram is such a powerful tool with that as well. So I really love to hear that. And I think it it really can help create a lot more depth when maybe 
like if there is a more withdrawn type that doesn't love these deep conversations as much as a two does, it kind of gives some language and scaffolding for them to open up in that realm to help bridge that um, longing and connection that another type might have or vice versa. Absolutely. And I think for the other thing is, is that like, you know, for me now I understood more, well, he's a body type. He's fallen asleep to himself, his feelings, his needs. It's not that he isn't sharing with me because he doesn't want to. He literally doesn't have the language that mm-hmm. I have as a heart type because I live in my emotions all the time. So like for me, it was just that like understanding that it's like he does not have the capacity right now. It doesn't mean he never will, mm-hmm. but he's not being stubborn and not sharing with me because he doesn't want to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's just, yeah, there's so many in-depth pieces with each of the nine types. And, and when I work with a couple, I can show them like, what do you need to thrive in a relationship? What do you need to thrive in a relationship? How are you meeting that for each other? And where is an opportunity for, you know, for growth? And it's a lot of times the rubs that they've been having in their relationship for a really long time. But the, mm-hmm. the spouse understanding the need is coming from a desire and a fear that's deeper underneath of that helps them to be like, oh, the compassion piece. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Now I can see you're not being needy. I can see you're not being, you know, accusatory that I'm not doing this for you. It's it's literally a human need you have that is different from me. And as true and real as my lens is to me, yours is to you. And as much as I need this thing on the piece of paper, you need that thing. And so let me ha- see how I can provide that for you and stretch myself in that way. Um, and so many of us have said like, oh, I'm just bad with my emotions or I just don't know what to do with it. And that's, that's been what we've rested our laurels on. And it's like, well, there's space for you to balance your heart center. There is a a whole full emotional world for you to explore. And with the Enneagram, we get language around that too, because with these centers of intelligence, the head, the heart, and the body comes a, a core emotional struggle. And just bringing that up to someone, your core emotional struggle is with shame. Your core emotional struggle is with fear and anxiety. It's with rage and anger. Ooh, you know, like, what does that even mean? And like, just getting mm-hmm. into the language of emotion for, for me as a hard type, I'm like, not everybody knows this, but like, no, they really don't. <laughs> they really don't. And that's okay. It's mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. And I really love how earlier you were naming like the importance of working on that before partnership too, yeah. like really getting to know yourself, really getting to know these things about you so that you're not necessarily like projecting it on your partner to like fix all of those things or fill these like stories that like another person can't fill. This is the work for you to do. So I really love that the Enneagram gives a tool to help know that part of yourself better and work with it as you engage with different relationships in your life. Yeah. I find that a lot of people haven't, a lot of people think that their childhood is in the past or they had a good childhood. So there's no way that Mm -hmm. any of that is actually affecting what they're doing today. But the Enneagram has um, the the lost childhood message and that has been internalized as a message that you still hold today that again is not true, but you've told yourself it is. So for each of the nine types, because of that connection, disconnection or ambivalence towards the protective or nurturing figure that we briefly discussed earlier, there is an internalized message that we're still is running under the surface in our subconscious telling us things like for the ones it's not okay to make mistakes Mm -hmm. for us twos, It's not okay to have your own needs. And like, we, we know in our heads, logically, that's not true. Yeah. But, but emotionally and physically, we act on those things as if they are. And so again, challenging our own subconscious and our own awareness is just, again, a lot of deep work that you're you're not going to get from other personality tests because it's not so ingrained in us from childhood. Mm -hmm. And if someone can, can, I don't want to say fix, but work on that message before they get into relationships. So they're not again, projecting that out to their partner, like huge. Yeah. If you're already in a relationship, still do the work, please, please. Yeah. <laughs> it will only help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I had posed this question to the community, just like letting people send in what they wanted to know. And there were two questions that I think are really powerful um, that I want to give voice to today. And one was, how can the Enneagram be used in social social movements to bridge across cultures, communication styles, and justice issues? Do you mm. mind leaning into that? Yeah, that's beautiful. I, I think there's some, like, so um, I think I, I'm going to try to say his name right. Urano Paez, um, he has a podcast with Beatrice Chestnut. They're authors of 
my favorite Enneagram book for growth, which is the Enneagram Guide to Waking Up. And mm -hmm. um, he has done a lot of work with the Enneagram in different cultures um, and, and how, it, how it's utilized in different cultures and even the the core type of different cultures, if you will. So for like the United States is kind of an Enneagram type three culture where we're all about success and looking good and pulling up our bootstraps and just mm -hmm. moving forward. And then like kind of, you know, putting almost to the different cultures, their overall arching um, archetype that their culture brings. And I think that in itself is a really interesting way of doing things. Um, I haven't um, leaned into his studying too much, just listening to his podcast and hearing him talk about it a little bit. Um, so that would be a great person to listen to or to mm -hmm. kind of like read about um, his his passions with that. Uh, I, I see it as being a tool for connection across all cultures, across all political thoughts, um, because we can understand why that person holds that lens so truly to themselves. Um, and I, that's why the passion I have is to impact as many people as possible and just to get as many people as possible to know and understand themselves. Because I truly believe if we are a more self-aware world, if we are more aware of our own like weaknesses, blind spots, um, communication patterns, if each person would just learn this about themselves the collective capacity of the universe to just be a better place, right? Like there's still going to be, but like, because there's the unhealthy average and healthy behaviors, it, it challenges us as humans to get to a healthier place. And I don't know very many people who, when they hear that, don't want to learn what that means. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not answering the question directly, but because I, I, I've made it a passion myself to get as many people in as many circumstances and places to know this. Um, but there's people out there doing the work on a bigger, grander scale, um, trying to get people in the world to learn about it. And I think that doing podcasts like this and just getting the message out there that there is a tool that can do this, become curious, um, is just going to, again, build that collective capacity for all of us to be better people. And then I don't want to say better people, but more connected to ourselves so that we can connect mm -hmm. better with others. Fuller people, better understanding yeah. for sure. Because yeah, I'm not saying like no one's bad or I mean yeah. there are bad people, but like we we don't need to fix things. But I do think if we could hold the mirror up to ourselves, because we're so busy blaming other people for things mm -hmm. that it it's like no, like the Taylor Swift song. It's like no, you're the problem. Like I'm the problem with <laughs> me. Like I need exactly. to know that I am the problem here and quit mm -hmm. blaming other people and take control of my own stuff. Right? Yeah, definitely. So another question that someone sent in, which I love, I feel like this one's really relatable, is what does it mean if the number or type I'm assigned to makes me feel boxed in or makes me cringe? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's another reason why finding your type can be hard because mm -hmm. <laughs> the exact thing that you really don't love about yourself is probably what makes a big part of your type structure up. Um, and that's a, a part of my job that, um, I kind of love, which is kind of mean, but like, I love that tough love moment where I'm like, kind of what I just said, like, you're the problem. So if you hate it when other people are super critical or really angry or really what, whatever it is, if you're like that person's so X, Y, Z, they're so fake, they're so whatever, guess what? That's probably something that's a part of you. That's probably a, bi a blind spot for you. That's probably your thing that you need to work on. And so that means you've probably found your type. And um, the work it, it is not easy. It doesn't feel good, but it's up to you to not criticize yourself for it. And again, accept how you've gotten here and having clarity around that helps you to kind of release yourself from the self-judgment and criticism and be more accepting and curious. And if you don't like that thing, there's an invitation for you to stop, right? Like if you, if you don't like that other people are critical or harsh or use their anger unproductively against people, then make sure you're not doing that. Take that out of the universe, right? Um, and so I feel like it's not boxing you in unless you stop and stay stuck there. So mm -hmm. if you see that thing and you go, ew, I don't like that. I'm not looking at that again. Then you're going to stay stuck. You know, yeah. like if you're like, I don't ooh, like that's up to you then. And you can leave it alone, but it's still going to be true whether or not you engage with it. And the fact that there is a whole system that's going to help you become free from that should give you the hope and 
the lean into it. But if you're not ready yet, if you've got too much trauma you've been through, then go to therapy, work through your trauma, and then get into your personality, right? Because those things can get interwoven over the past. And, and that's how I found myself with the Enneagram is going through EMDR therapy, um, you know, and just fully healing my being so that I could get to um, the conscious choice making side of things. Mm -hmm. And I would really lean in from from the work that I do too of like not being stuck in those parts that are – that maybe we don't like – initially love about ourselves, right? Like not being stuck in them, not like repeating those patterns, mm -hmm. but can we fully accept these parts of ourselves that are there and have compassion for where those beliefs and fears and longings come from? And can we like embody that as our a part of our wholeness? Can we accept it? Can we steep it in love? And then mm -hmm. we can take the work and necessary action to step into the fullness of who we are and adjust and change patterns of behavior. Absolutely beautifully um, said. Absolutely beautifully said because that deep self-acceptance of that part of yourself you don't love right now is what's going to heal it. And then when someone else is acting in that way, you're going to say, oh, there's a part of you that needs to be healed and that's your work to do. But I can understand with compassion because I've worked on myself in that way, that that's coming from a place that's, that's, not your best self, but that's, that's okay. And that's, mm -hmm. and, and not being so affected by, um, other people's or reactive, reactive to that. And that is the whole journey of the Enneagram, because I feel like, you know, my clients will send me a message like, why am I doing this thing? Or like, why did that happen? And there is an answer there for that. But then after I've kind of helped guide them back to, it's probably one of these core motivators or fears that you're being driven from or your defense mechanism um, that it's coming from. Once they have that language, they're like, I'm feeling this way because, and they understand mm -hmm. where that's coming from. Wow. It's totally understandable that I'd be feeling rejected right now because I have a core fear of rejection and I'm very sensitive to that. And that's okay. That's just who I am. Um, I don't need to allow that to take over my whole day today. I don't need to keep putting mental, physical, and emotional energy into that. So it's like the self coaching that can mm -hmm. come from having that deep understanding of why that icky behavior or not so nice thing about yourself is, is bothering you because I feel that we're, we don't, um, get enough validation from ourselves because we either dismiss our needs, we dismiss our wants, we dismiss our emotions, um, and just try to keep trudging forward, but we should be validating and saying it's understandable. Of course, you're feeling this way. Yes. And you know, not, it's lovely to get that from other people, but you have to be able to do that for yourself first. And so that's mm -hmm. a lot of the work I do with my clients is like uh, specifically around their needs and um, reinforcing those because anger is an unmet need. And so if we can get at that need and get it met, then you'll be a less angry person, a less reactive person. Mm. So I have two questions for you before we end our time yes. today. Um, so one, I feel like we've been kind of touching on this throughout our conversation, but how how um, does the Enneagram support mental health and well-being? And what is one thing you would recommend listeners do today to work with the Enneagram as a tool to support them in their lives? Yeah, there um, again with the levels of development, which it's a very intense, like you know, thing to get into to like really get deep into it. But um, it gives kind of voice to how each of the types can disintegrate into extremely unhealthy behaviors that where we have personality disorders and you know just it, it the darkness of the human experience, if you will, um, all the way through up to the healthiest levels of development, and so. Um, basically acknowledging that there is a space within each one of us that can be dark and light that can mm -hmm. be, um, that we can lean into and step into those healthier spaces for ourselves. Um, and that there's hope for each of us that, um, should we engage, be curious, um, and be open to, and say, what if this is true about me, that we can heal those parts of ourselves and again, live more present here in this moment and connected with the here in this moment so that we have our full human experience. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the way to do that is to figure out your Enneagram type. <laughs> like this mm -hmm. is honestly, like if you don't know it or you've been kind of like, oh yeah, I took a test. I'm not sure. Da, 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 da. Like honestly, 
just, it, it takes time. It, it, it takes time to learn it and to really understand it. And I would say there's a lot of distractions with different, like, what's your wing? What's your growth? What did it, learn your core type, learn what mm. is my type and what makes you that type is that core motivation, the core motivators, fears, and desires, and start asking yourself that exact thing. Why did I just do that? And become curious. Before you do something, why am I doing this? Which of these motivators is driving me and which one, and do I want that to be driving me? So get back into the driver's seat of your life and say, oh, I was going to just call so-and-so. Why am I calling them? Is it for me? Am I trying to get something out of this? Um, and it's amazing how when you just start to do that in question, like, why am I doing this? How the reactivity goes down and the curiosity goes up and the present moment becomes more important than what happened in the past or what's going to happen in the future. Mm, I love that. And how can people work with you, support the work that you do and stay in touch? Because I just loved soaking in all of your insights today. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things to do and something I specialize in is connecting people with their core type. And so we talked about how tests can be difficult. Um, it can be difficult to admit these things about ourselves. Um, and our initial response might be what we want to hear about ourselves rather than what is true. Uh, mm -hmm. So I do offer typing sessions. And even if you know your core type, it is an amazing one hour session that's interview style where you're the expert on you and I listen to you and connect you with, wow, that I wonder if that's coming from this core motivator. I wonder if it's because, and let's talk about that and connect you with that information. Um, so that's one hour. And then I also have an hour and a half session called a leveling session, but it's not about figuring out your level of development. It's learning the levels of development and uh, looking at those core dynamics of the fears and desires that arise at each level, the attitudes, which are the inner things that are rolling around that other people can't see and the behaviors, which which is what other people see that are like stemming from those. Um, we do a deep dive on that and then set intentions around, okay, this is an average behavior that I'm still, or attitude that I'm still struggling with. What do I want to replace that with from a healthier side of things? And intentions then turn into habits, right? If you choose to do so. Um, so I package those two together and um, it's an amazing just two session package. And then of course I have my whole elite life journey if, if it goes from there, but those two things can have the um, capacity to be life-changing, to be honest. And so anyone would benefit from engaging in that and to do the work on your own, to do all the research and um, resource gathering would take you many weeks slash months. <laughs> um, so just pay me because I've got it all put together for you. So come on over. I know I sound like wheeling and dealing. I'm in my three wing, um, <laughs> but I've put it together for you um, in, in that capacity. So I'd love to meet anybody who's curious about it, but I do have social media. I, I post a lot of free content. I have a blog um, and weekly emails that I send out with more information. Us twos love to be resources for people um, because then we're central to you. Like if you mm -hmm. go, oh, I know I can ask her for something. So um, I've got all the resources and um, I do workshops, keynote speak. I mean, you name it. <laughs> like I'm, I'm there. I'm with it. If it has to do with the Enneagram and you're curious if you know, you want someone to speak on something, parenting, work. I mean, I'll, yes. What is it? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I'll make sure all the links are in the show notes for people to work with you and stay connected with you. Chelsea, thank you so much for taking time to really help us dive in and look at ourselves more deeply and the wholeness of who we are and connect to that common humanity and compassion. I think the Enneagram is a really powerful tool for this. And I really appreciate you speaking to this with us today. Thank you, Holly.